Good morning, everybody. Uh, I just thought I'd make a short video. I hope it's short. And uh, this scripture came on my mind, and I wanted to share it with you. Uh, I'm going to be in the book of Nehemiah. Um, I'm going to start at the fourth chapter. To give you a little background about Nehemiah, Nehemiah was a the cupbearer in the, the king's service. He um, would taste the cup, I guess, before he gave it to the king. So that way, if there was something poison, if somebody tried to poison the king, then Nehemiah would uh, be the one to, to die instead of the king. And he uh, came to the king one day to give him his drink or serve him in some way. And uh, the king noticed that he was sad. He said, why are you so sad? And I suppose Nehemiah said something to the effect of, don't worry about me, king. Uh, I, my problems were too small for you to worry about. And then the king insisted, so he told him that the wall had burned down around Jerusalem and he wanted to go rebuild it. And the king gave him everything he needed to go back and rebuild the wall. So that's where the this story picks up. And uh, when Nehemiah went to build the wall, there was people that would try to hinder him as it will be in our lifetime. When we try to do something, there'll be something start up to hinder us. And uh, so I'm gonna read, but it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we built the wall, he was wroth and took indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren in the army of Samaria, what do these feeble Jews do? Will they, uh, what do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which a fox, even even that which they build, if a fox get go up, he shall break down their wall. That's the first tactic of the enemy. And I want you to be aware of it, that when you start to build something, whether it's build a marriage, help build um, a friendship, uh, a church, a church, then the first thing he's going to do is make fun of you. Why you know you can't talk? How do you think you can preach? Your testimonies are no good. Nobody wants to hear them anyway. So he'll make fun of you. Um, if he sees that'll work, well, he doesn't need to do anything else. But if he don't, if that don't work, he's got other wiles. Uh, this story to me is talking about uh, staying awake, not, not going to sleep. A lot of the wrecks that happen, happen right at home. I remember years ago, me and Brother Jack Kelly, we used to go up north two or three times a year um, and visit up there, up to Indiana, to Crown Point, to South Haven or wherever. And uh, we would leave. I had a company car that only I could drive or my wife or whatever. So I wound up doing all the driving just about if we were in my car. And I wasn't sleepy when we left Indiana. I wasn't sleepy when we came through Kentucky. I wasn't sleeping when we came sleepy when we came through Tennessee, but by the time we got to Alabama, I could barely hold my head up, and that's the way it is on this journey. Uh, I've been on the way almost forty three years. A lot of people seventy years or whatever. We are too close to home for anybody to think about going to sleep now. What this scripture is talking about to me is distractions. You can uh, be in your car. Uh, maybe teenagers be in their car and some some people be in the back drinking a Coke and uh, something funny and they get tickled and spray it all over you. And you turn to the look and see what just happened. And by the time you look back down the road, you you may be in a wreck. They say if you look off for five seconds, you will go the length of a football field. Texan and such like as that. Um, that's that's a distraction that, that may cost you your life. Let's go on and see what the enemy did after the uh, making fun didn't work. And it, and it goes on down here to say, uh, 
before I get to that. So we built a wall and the wall was joined together into the half of thereof for the people had a mind to work. There you go. If we have a mind to work, we can do anything together. Unity. Now I'm going to read some this, uh, read on, I'm going to skip to the sixth chapter. And uh, some of these names are pretty complicated for me. So if I don't get them right, don't worry. We won't worry about it. So when, when the enemy saw that the, uh, that, the, that didn't work. Let, let me back up though. Uh, and just in verse 17 of chapter four, four and get to that. It said, they which build it on the wall and they which bear burdens for those that laden, every one of them with one of their hands wrought in a work and the other hand held a weapon. So in other words, they had a weapon in one hand and a tool in the other hand to build. They fought a while and they built a while. That's what we have to do here. We have to fight a while and build a while. Paul said, oh, you fought a good fight. There is a fight to, to, to be done. So get back to the sixth chapter. He said, in, now when it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Gershom the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built a wall and there was no breach left therein, I had not set up the doors upon yet set up a, I had not set up the doors upon the gates. That Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some of the villages of the plains of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a good work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? When the enemy tries to come up the wall on you and you have to pull out your weapon and your tool, uh, and he sees that making fun of you didn't work, fighting you didn't work, then he'll use that trick and he'll say, come on down here. Let's talk about this. You're killing yourself. You're going to church too much. Um, He'll want you to make a compromise, and we cannot afford to do that. And then I want to skip over, I believe, to the eighth chapter, and I want you to listen to. They they had um, not got to deal with the word, and I think it was four hundred and something years, and they discovered the word, and this is what it said. They were so thrilled about it. Are you thrilled about the word? If this word was cut off from us, we've got video and things like that right now. But if we, we, we can't get to church like we want to, and uh, we need to value the word. He said there was going to, Amos said there was going to be a famine, not of bread and water, but of the hearing of the word. And uh, chapter 8 says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. I know you've heard of water gate before. This is... Uh, this is where it probably originated here, the, the term Watergate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the gate, before the street that was before the water gate from the morning to midday. Now let me ask you something. Brothers and sisters, if uh, I'm, I said a short video, I hope. But what if I read from morning to evening? You'd you'd probably uh, fast forward this or even uh, stop it before before long. And uh, so they, you know, Paul preached all night long till the man fell out of the loft. Uh, so we can watch a TV show. We can do other f forms of entertainment, but we cannot hardly seem like to me listen that long to the Word of God. So from morning until midday, before the men and women that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the priest stood upon a pulpit of wood like we do at church, which they had made for that purpose, and beside him stood, and there was a bunch of people I'm not going to attempt to uh, you could to to call their name, but you can read his, their names are in chapter eight of Nehemiah verse four, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, like we are in church when we're at the pulpit. 
And when he opened it up, all the people stood up. Now that's a little different right there because most of the time the people are sitting in their seats trying to listen. Listen, and I uh, respect and appreciate that. But the people stood up and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, amen, amen, with the lifting up of their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And, uh, and it mentions a bunch of other names in verse 7. And it said, cause the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So read, they read in the book, of the, in the law of God, distinctly, and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Brother Lodge Holland told me and Brother Jack Kelly that the word of God is supposed to make sense. And Nehemiah, which is the... To Shatha or whatever it is, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not nor weep, for the people wept when they heard the words of the Lord. I wonder how it would be if the next time we went back to Marineville or, or wherever, and we stood up to read, and the people stood on their feet with their hands raised, with tears flowing out of their eyes. Don't you know that God would be pleased with that? I was thinking about, uh, I heard this story, I wasn't alive or there then, but I heard this story that they said that this brother, this elder brother, when Brother Brown would preach, he would get over in between the benches and get down on his knees and pray for Brother Brown. And that was so would be so powerful. But as I said in the near the beginning, I think that a lot of this uh, Nehemiah is talking to us about distractions, and we don't need to be distracted at this point because we're too near the end. The this too shall pass. The coronavirus it will pass, and we uh, want to be prepared for that day when we get to meet our Savior. I don't have anything else to say much this morning, but that I love you. And uh, I mentioned before, and I'll mention again, it, in Ecclesiastes, the third chapter says, uh, there's a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. I'm a hugger. I came from a line of huggers. My mother was a hugger. And uh, so that's my normal, that's my normal. And right now, um, we're not able to hug, embrace, uh, shaking hands is even difficult. But when this thing is over and you see me coming and you don't want to hug next, you better step aside because that's what I'm planning on doing. May the good Lord bless all of you.